Okay, we have a quorum. I'm going to call to order the uh, March 26th meeting of the Oklahoma City Riverfront Redevelopment Authority. All, item two is items from the chairman, and I don't have anything. Item three is the minutes. Do we have any corrections to the February 27th meeting? Need a motion? Cast your votes. For some reason, it won't let me vote. that passes. Item four is a consent docket. We have the oil and gas revenue report and the Oklahoma River corridor events update. Any questions on either one of those? Any motion? Cast your vote. It passes. Item five is the primary items. Item A is the Oklahoma River project summary. Yes. Good afternoon, Jay Shumway, Public Works. Um, it's been another very active month, a lot of construction projects going in the Eastern Basin simultaneously. Um, once the projects were completed in the flow line, uh, that allowed us to be able to close the Eastern Basin and start to impound water. Um, we were fortunate enough uh, on March 22nd to have a local storm and we've now got full impoundment back in that basin. Uh, we have noticed a, a few elevated volumes of debris and we're addressing those now, but the basin should be functional and, and back for, uh, for back for use. Is there any questions? Any questions? Thank you, Jeff. Any Thank motion you. on that to receive? Cast your vote. That passes. Item B is an update from team design on the Eastern Basin construction project. They're also going to give us, I thought it'd be for some of the newer members, I thought it'd be nice to go back to an update of what they have done over the years. <coughs> Maybe they don't want to do what they've done. <laughs> Dennis? Uh, Chairman Myers, mem <clears throat> members of the trust, Dennis Clowers representing team design today. Uh, and as Chairman Marr said a few weeks back, he asked me to put together uh, an update on what's going on on the river. And he and I further discussed that and uh, thought that since there are, there are some older, not age older, but people that have been on the trust for a while and are familiar with us, but there's others who aren't, I might give just an update on the history of team design and their involvement with the river. Is there a uh, remote, are you gonna? Okay, all right. Um, so that's our agenda, is to give you a brief history on team design, a history of the Oklahoma River, and talk about current projects. Go ahead. Um, team design actually began 65 years ago with a company called Howard Russell and Associates. <clears throat> uh, in 1965, it became Russell, Gravelin, and Douglas. Um, in 1972, it became RGDC when they added uh, uh, Bob Cornell as an architect. And then in 96, it became team design, or triad design, and then uh, two years ago, team design. Uh, <clears throat> the only remaining um, original partner of Russell Gravelin Douglas is Don Douglas, who is here with me today. And he's uh, ready and raring to correct me on anything that I say that's an error. Um, this is the way the river looked back in 1889 and 1890. I am told that Don may or may not have been around at that time. Um, we'll just leave that up to your imagination. Obviously a different facility than it looks like today. In the mid-50s, the Corps of Engineers did a major project to realign the river 
to make sure that water got out of town in a timely manner, and that's what engineers do. They make things straight and wide, and stuff flows through uh, a lot better. So in 1955, that Corps of Engineers project was finished. Um, in 1980, um, uh, RGDC was contracted by the city to come up with a master plan for the river, and that became what was called the String of Pearls. Had a lot of good ideas in it. Uh, unfortunately, there was no funding at the time to do any of that work, so that plan kind of sat idle for a time. Prior to the first map selection uh, that was held in 1993, um, RGDC was asked to come up with a corridor plan of things that could be done on the river if that sales tax passed. And uh, they did, they put that plan together. And obviously, MAPS 1 passed in 1993, and funding was available to build three dams on the river. RGDC was selected as a design engineer uh, to do the th design of the three dams, and the eastern dam is shown there on the right, first one that was completed in 1999. Um, next slide. Then in 2003, the Paul Brum Dam, which is just west of, of Western, and the May Avenue Dam were constructed, uh, which impounded river all the way back to about uh, Meridian. Um, since then, Team Design has uh, done some other projects on the river. The Corps of Engineers funded some, uh, some projects to do trails and bridges and beautification along the river. And then in 2006, when the decision was made, <clears throat> I think it was led by former Mayor, Mayor North to uh, put some river cruises on the river. Uh, RGDC, or Triad Design at the time, was contracted to do a transport, <clears throat> excuse me, mobility plan on the river. <clears throat> Later on, um, uh, Triad Design Group did the design on two landings, one at Meridian and one at the Stockyards. Later, uh, map, or our uh, Triad Design Group was part of a design team that uh, designed the uh, MAPS-3 Whitewater Facility, <clears throat> which is obviously uh, world known, and Mike has done a great job of managing that project. Uh, <clears throat> team Design also did some design work on some public works facilities down near Exchange where boats could be stored and worked on. Um, <clears throat> Jess mentioned in his uh, report a few minutes ago that uh, while the river was down, there were a couple of projects were done. One was uh, some work that needed to be done to the Eastern Dam, and another was to make some repairs in what's called Zone G of the South Canal, where it ties into the river. Part of that uh, project had been done with a reinforced concrete wall that had stone uh, into, the, um, into the, the concrete, which was very stable and is still there today. Unfortunately, there wasn't funding to do that all the way down to the river, so a stack stone um, design was done, and it hasn't fared so well. But uh, Public Works and Parks uh, put out a contract to re make those repairs, and all of that work was done while the river was down. If you haven't been down there, it, it looks very, very good. These uh, photos were taken during the construction of that. Uh, MAPS 4 included several projects on the river, and team design was selected to do uh, the MAPS 4 projects, and those consisted of, in priority, one, a pedestrian bridge from the north side of the river going over to the Elkana development. The second is a dam. The third, if funding is available, will be a public gathering area or a stage. So, go ahead, to the next slide. So the, the bridge, the pedestrian bridge is located a few hundred feet uh, west of Eastern, and it goes from the north side of the river and ties into the Okana development, as I said. Next slide. This is just a plan and a profile of the bridge. It's about 500 feet long. Uh, it's 20 feet wide. Um, it will have cable railing, a lighted rail, and it will have below deck uh, pier lighting. These are just some of the details that indicate uh, the cable railing that'll be alongside the bridge. And then the next slide would show the, uh, the lighted rail. 
and then the below deck uh, pier lights. There are four piers, and so all of those uh, piers would have lights on them to give them a little aesthetic uh, view. Um, the bids came in such that there were a couple of alternates that were, we were able to award. Uh, one is light poles and banner uh, poles, uh, similar to the other banner uh, brackets that you may see around the city. And then also included uh, will be pier cap medallions that will, um, a design that was agreed upon by uh, the Chickasaw tribe, uh, the Okana folks, the uh, First Americans Museum, uh, and these will also be included on the sides of those piers. This next slide gives you an, an idea of what the um, construction amount, there's right under $10 million of MAPS for money in the, all the projects combined. Uh, the bridge is going to take up the majority of that, as you see after the contract was awarded by the city council for the bridge. We have about $3 million left. Uh, that will go toward the, uh, the dam, uh, the next dam, which will be downstream from Eastern. Um, I'll show you that on a, at a later slide, but the council awarded that contract on March the 12th. Uh, we're just about ready for the contractor to begin construction, and it should be completed by the end of this calendar year. Uh, the, Next project, as I mentioned, will be another dam that will be downstream about a quarter mile from the Eastern Bridge. And the purpose of this dam is to impound water, not to create a, a recreational facility, just, but just to improve the aesthetics in the area. If you might glance off the, east, or the uh, east side of the Eastern Bridge, there's a lot of debris, uh, things that have washed down there. And so this, the purpose of this is just to cover that up with about four to five feet of water just to provide a better aesthetic view of the river downstream from Eastern as well as upstream. The last project I'm gonna talk about is um, a project that was funded by the Federal Transit Association and uh, by Embark um, and the Chickasaw Tribe. And it was for, for a boat landing to be constructed on the um, south side of the river near the O'Connor project and this that slide that you're looking at right now, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little uh, light-colored piece. That is actually depicting the end of the pedestrian bridge. So this will give you a perspective of where that bridge ties in to this particular area. Um, the scope of the work is to create a cove so that the riverboats can dock there, unload passengers, and uh, to create a public place. Uh, what we've uh, designed there is an amphitheater type sitting area that would be available for the stage if there's enough maps for money to actually build the stage later on. The next few slides are just some other views of what this project might look like. And the last one is then looking back across the river toward the north. Um, <clears throat> team design was selected for the project in late 2022. Uh, as I uh, indicated, it includes uh, a riverboat landing near the First Americans Museum. On the south side of the river, uh, the FTA grant provided 80% of the funds and a local match provided the other 20. Um, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with the Okana development. Um, and the First Americans Museum that opened in 2021. Uh, the entire O'Connor development is scheduled to open in January or February of 2025. The preliminary engineering report for the Embark project was uh, submitted to the Embark board in September of 2023, and bids were received about, uh, well, on February 7th, and we've got some challenges with the bids that came in. Uh, they were higher than expected, so we're working through that with the city staff. Our intent was to have a contract um, on the Embark board by April 5th, which is their next meeting. We're working to try to get that done. We're not sure if that will happen, but uh, we'll be glad to keep you all posted on the progress of that. Uh, before I close, I just want to mention maybe a few other projects that you might be thinking about for the future. Um, we could, we could go further downstream, maybe around 23rd Street, out by Sooner Road. 
and create another dam there that would create a recreational uh, ponding in the river. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be connected by boats from, from where we are now because there's no lock in the eastern dam to get the boats down there. However, we could go upstream from the three dams that we have on the river, maybe up toward Lake Overholzer, put another dam or two to impound water all the way to Lake Overholzer. Just some thoughts for projects in the future. And that's all I have, and I'll be glad to respond to questions. Any questions for Dennis? I've got one. The low water dam, uh, is that going to be a fixed dam, uh, simply a flow over, no way to lower it or anything in high water situations? Right. right. It's going to be done with sheet piling. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? I'm, uh, just to add to your little list, the, 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 the uh, what am I trying to say? The, the uh, USS Oklahoma City sale and it, the park that's going to be created around it. Uh, there's, I know that there's been people say that might be a good place for another boat landing. I don't know. But the, that's going to be in, at the end of uh, the park system down there. Down at the, that'd be a very nice spot. Any other questions? Thank you, Dennis. Okay. Thank you all. Then motion to accept that. Cast your vote. And that passes. Uh, item C is an update on key to home partnership for homeless services. We have Jamie Caves here, and uh, I think Erica Warren is going to do the presentation. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me today. My name is Erica Warren. I'm the communications manager for the key to home partnership. slide. This has our agenda. And um, so we're just going to be looking at kind of the overall structure um, and overview of the Key to Home Partnership, what that is and um, kind of what we're working on, our strategic framework um, over the next two years, so our key priorities and goals, um, and then progress to date. And then we'll just take a quick look at how you can help and how you can get engaged in the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. Um, the Key to Home Partnership is a public-private partnership of over 40 organizations that are working to prevent and end homelessness in Oklahoma City. These partners are made up of nonprofit service providers, community leaders, and most importantly, those with lived experience that can help inform the partnership's work and focus. And they do this through piloting and testing different programs and reporting results back to the system through dedicated work groups. The City of Oklahoma City serves as the lead agency across this um, partnership, which means that the city is responsible for developing and implementing the overall systemic response to homelessness in our community. The city is tasked with monitoring and improving the overall system performance by increasing capacity and efficiency across the homeless response system. So what do we mean when we say public-private partnership? The public-private model is critical to the success of the Key to Home partnership and because it allows us to maximize and utilize the public dollars that are available to us um, while using the private funds to remove barriers that are not covered by those public dollars. Next slide, please. And um, looking at our strategic framework, we've laid out four key goals over the next two years um, that we hope to achieve. And um, goal number one is revamping our governance, governance system. And um, this is a goal that we have already completed. And so we have increased our oversight board from eight to 18 members. Um, and the idea behind this was that we really wanted to expand the board to include more high level decision makers 
um, stakeholders in our community, and again, most importantly, those with lived experience to help inform the work that we're doing and the priorities that we're setting. Um, goal number two was to address homelessness differently. Um, we all know that we can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. So goal two, we really wanted to, to think about how we can do things differently um, to move our work forward. So this means having a dedicated team at the city level um, tasked with managing the resources and coordinating efforts across that um, continuum of partners. Um, it also means enhancing our data solutions for increased accuracy um, and providing real-time access to that data. Um, and increasing access to affordable housing by leveraging the MAPS4 funding for permanent supportive housing units. Goal number three is focused on expanding youth services and diverting youth from ever entering the homeless response system um, in the first place, with a goal to divert at least 100 youth by the end of 2025. And then goal number four is to reduce chronic unsheltered homelessness by 500 um, by the end of 2025 through a new housing pathway called the Encampment Rehousing Initiative. And um, this new initiative is a new um, pathway to housing um, and what the Encampment Rehousing Initiative does is go directly into those encampments um, and it moves folks, residents of those encampments directly into housing within four to six weeks. Next slide, please. Um, so some progress to date. The Encampment Rehousing Initiative was success, successfully piloted in early 2023. It officially launched in September of 2023 and since that time, um, the Encampment Rehousing Initiative has housed, actually, I just got word, um, 102 people, um, update from 101 on the slide, as of today. Um, and as of today, zero of that 102 individuals have returned to the homeless response system. Next slide, please. And this is just a photo of um, a former encampment that was along the river. This was at Southwest 15th and Meridian. Um, so this is an encampment that um, had been present under that bridge. Our outreach teams had the opportunity to go in and work with residents living under that bridge, building rapport, um, understanding their needs, what complex needs they have, um, and what services they might need. Um, and individuals from that encampment were then successfully housed, um, remaining in stable housing with those additional wraparound supports and case management um, so that they can stay stably housed. Next slide, please. Um, so how can you help? Um, at Key to Home, we like to say that everyone has a part to play in solving homelessness, um, and every single one of us does have a part to play. So um, if you ever are concerned about someone experiencing homelessness, um, please alert the Action Center. Um, I had the opportunity to meet the folks that work in the Action Center, um, and they're some of the most dedicated people and positive people I've um, ever encountered, especially considering the work that they do. Um, if you're ever concerned about someone who is in a situation that you think is critical and needs um, response pretty quickly, um, please alert the Action Center and detail that. Um, we have response teams that can come out within an hour to respond to someone in need. And um, you can also request litter abatement. So if it's a, a city owned property that is involved um, in your concern, you can make a request for that. Um, and you can also request code violation and like junk and debris or de graffiti. Um, to access the Action Center, you can call, you can text, um, you can email. There's also a very user-friendly app called OKC Connect that I would encourage you to download. Next slide, please. Um, a couple of other ways that you can get involved is volunteering. And um, we have many, many opportunities across those 40 plus partners that I mentioned earlier. Um, anything from preparing meals to um, move-in kits, um, helping with meal trains, household goods, pretty much anything that you can think of, there is a need for and we can get you plugged in. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned before, and this is a public-private partnership, um, and private dollars are critical to the success of our efforts. So um, if you're so inclined, there is also an opportunity to donate. Um, you can go to ketahomeokc.org to learn more. And that wraps up the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Um, yeah, I you have. You mentioned donating furniture or clothing or whatever. Where do they take that? Um, so we have various partners that um, oh, are to, in need. To the existing places that take Yes, that. existing agencies that are yeah. already working and um, with the homeless population. So there's youth providers, there's um, various agencies that would take those donations gladly. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I, I'm curious to ask if you can talk a little bit more. Oh, sorry, it's okay. didn't get the clip right. Um, if you can talk a little bit more about the landlord engagement portion of the program, um, because I do think that is something that's like fairly unique to this. Um, I think the way that we've done coordinated housing um, is to ha not only have the city be sort of the um, sort of coordinating body, but um, but kind of that that opportunity. And, and I think too, it kind of um, helps also answer the question of like why we need. The private funds, um, because of that flexibility of how they're being used, um, that sometimes our our federal and other sources of funding can't always respond to. So I'm curious to if you could share more about that, so folks can hear about that aspect of the the initiative and learn more about. It. So I, I'm Jamie Caves. Um, the landlord engagement team is really important because. There are many of the people that we're housing have barriers to housing. And so the landlord engagement team can address those barriers with landlords. Um, so we have staff that go out and they talk to and advocate with landlords, especially landlords that have many properties so that we can position um, some units across the city in multiple complexes. And they work with them to, to let them know the benefits of working with these clients because they have case management support, because they have rental subsidies um, and other supports in place to help them um, stabilize. And what you're talking about with the public-private partnership is the benefit here with the landlord engagement team is that we're able to pay hold fees. And that's why we can move so quickly with the encampments because we were having an issue where people would be, they'd receive a voucher and it would take them months and months and months to hunt for housing and to find a unit that would accept the voucher and that they could move into. Well, our landlord engagement team is out there working constantly on finding these units. And so when we go into um, an encampment, we quickly learn that there's 20 people that will be on the by name list. And so the landlord engagement team, while we're collecting documents and doing the other pieces here, the landlord engagement team is going to identify those properties and secure those units. They use private dollars to hold those units so that they can wait for the week or two until those are those people are ready to move into them. And that is a, a, a key to being able to move so quickly to identify the units because we cannot use public dollars to hold. We're also able to use those dollars to pay for move-in kits. We know that people are more successful when their basic needs are met, when they have a mattress and towels and dishes to cook with. And so we're able to use those dollars for move-in kits. And then we can also pay on occasion, there are people that need uh, a risk fee if they've had prior evictions and other concerns that the landlord doesn't want to rent to. There's the ability to pay like an additional deposit with those private dollars in order to encourage them to like take the risk on that client so they can have the opportunity to move into housing. I appreciate that um, detail because I, I think that's my, been my experience in talking with members of the community is this like perception that if people are living unsheltered and they might be under a bridge or in some kind of encampment um, that you know, like housing will just appear and that, or, or that people don't want, you know, the help that's being offered, but that, that piece of having something available that you can offer that actually offers choice. I was um, recently speaking with the president of the um, continuum about how sort of great it is to say, oh, we have the unit in this part of town and someone saying, ah, I don't really want to live. That's not where I, you know, know my, you know, the, my community or the healthcare I go, or whatever, you know, that's not where I 
um, want to be, but that the that ability to sort of um, have options um, actually helps people feel ownership over. They're not just being kind of handed the bottom rung option. They're they're being given the option of um, making a choice that that they get to have ownership over um, and and can make that decision about what's going to be best for them. Um, and I think that that piece is so key to um, sort of re, I think you said earlier, like re, not just doing the same thing over and over again, because I know speaking with a lot of outreach workers, the struggle of trying to keep track of folks when they're living in, in such chaotic environments, um, or, you know, again, like their papers all get destroyed, and so they have to start all over again with their ID and documentations and all that stuff that can take so long um, to just have that available and ready for people um, is really, really amazing, and um, it's exciting to see um, a sort of pursue that model. Um, I'm curious if you can also kind of talk about, because um, I know this is something I get from residents and questions about kind of how you prioritize or have been, I guess, prioritizing which encampments to sort of start engaging at, at what times. Um, just because I know, I, I think I know a little bit about how you do it, but um, but I know, you know, going to the action center, it's like, okay, when when is, you know, when can I expect sort of the response? Um, and I think especially, you know, I heard you say that there's someone that can come out an hour and sort of more um, just sort of help address like maybe the, in, the need in the moment, but that longer term, like, you know, there's an encampment around the corner from my neighborhood. Like, is it on the list? When will it be addressed? Those sorts of things. Curious to hear how you all do that prioritization. Because I know I, one question I've asked in the past is like, can we do them all? Like, and it's, well, we only have certain capacity of, you know, a certain amount of staff and um, capacity at the moment, so kind of curious to hear if you can help us understand how that prioritization works. Yes, so um, first of all, I want to just say that we have a 97% acceptance rate, so 97% of those people that we've approached and offered housing to have accepted housing, and I think that is just really important for people to understand, that they, they do want housing. Um, as far as the priority, um, it <laughs> it's kind of a lame answer. It's really just, there's a big matrix that we use to help us identify properties that, that we actually will use in the future. Right now, we're working on developing processes so that we can um, close encampments on private property and railroad property. So right now, we've just been really working with the low-hanging fruit, which is city-owned property. So we're just about to finalize those processes. Things are going well, moving forward. Um, but but that has largely been what we've been doing. We also have been effectively working with Oklahoma Department of Transportation. So you'll see some of those um, underpasses like 39th in Pennsylvania, that was closed because we already have a, a pro partnership in place with them. Um, but a lot of that matrix in determining how we select camps is about not overburdening our systems. So when we're asking a group to do the cleanup, we don't want to ask the same group. So if if Parks is cleaning up this location, we don't want to ask Parks to clean up multiple encampments right back to back. So they need capacity and b budget room. And so we're just like kind of strategically trying to be sure that we're not tasking the same groups of people over and over. Um, we also are trying to ensure that we are closing encampments in different wards that we're not only working in the same ward. So this whole matrix is kind of a scoring tool that helps us just make sure that we're spreading out evenly um, and not overburdening any of our partners. Any other questions? Yes, okay. can you tell me, um, I know it's been a short time frame and things, but have you had any, once they're housed, how long is that anticipated that they will be living there. And have we had anyone actually go through the program and move on? Um, I, I think that there are a few, but I don't have data specifically on how many have moved on because we're just finishing that 12 months in the pilot. So we're just barely past 12 months. But that answers your question is we provide a 12-month subsidy and wraparound supportive services. The goal is to right-size the housing solution, so almost immediately when they move into housing, our case management team is working to 
um, identify the level of need, the barriers, and what kind of support this person is gonna need and start putting that like kind of exit plan in place. So some people are going to need permanent supportive housing. They're gonna need longer term support. Permanent supportive housing typically averages about five years of supportive services in a housing subsidy. Um, some people won't need all of the 12 months before the, the case management can kind of fall away and they can start paying some of that rent or saving towards a, a unit where they'll pay their own deposits. So everybody is different on the level of need. Our goal is to get them connected to community resources to increase their income, whether that's um, disability or retirement or employment, just whatever it is for that individual during that 12 months so that they're ready for that sustainability and, and can be stably housed after that 12 months. Just a quick thank you. The work that you guys have done in the first 12 months of this pilot program and the efforts that have been very, um, kept you busy, kept you up late at night, kept you on your toes. It's it's making a difference and we're really grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Need a motion to accept that. Cast your vote. Kathy. That passes. Item D is a quarterly River Sport Foundation update. Mike? Okay, good afternoon. Mike Knopp with River Sport. Um, well, let's go ahead and get started with the financial update. Um, I think it pretty much speaks for itself. A lot of our early in the year financials are all uh, associated with timing, and we had a lot of um, uh, what we contribute additional earned income and contributed support support come in through sponsorship and some things early on and some of the expenses um, in in our ramp up period as we're kind of in that period of getting ready for the season you know we do incur those expenses a couple things in particular we are currently replacing the conveyor belt on the at the Whitewater Center and that's something we have to purchase ourselves and then later then re submit that for reimbursement. So that is actually taking place as we speak. Um, there was a very significant cleaning exercise that went on with the Whitewater Center where it was drained again and, um, and just preparing it for this coming season and of course the Olympic trials in a month from now. So it's really important that we put our best foot forward for this event so we're trying to get everything uh, ready. But, we feel uh, like we're off to a good start. Um, from a development perspective, we are um, tracking ahead. Uh, we're a little over half our development annual development goal, so that that is um, that is good news. And certainly, trying to leverage the opportunities that Olympic Trials provides, as well as Row Fest, which will come uh, later this year. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Just want to give you an update on the winter training called adaptations that we had to make due to the river uh, draining. Uh, had to divide and conquer with programming out at Lake Overholzer, uh, the old Stroud House, and then also um, at the Exchange Boathouse. You probably, or if you go over that part of the river, it was very active throughout February because of all the programs that were relocated there um, with University of Oklahoma. And uh, there's, there's actually a, a this were in, we were in spring training period in the last week, so that there was a lot of activity. I have a picture of one of the Thunder players just to underscore. We did some other things like indoor events. We did an in, you know, indoor esports camp where we combined you know, virtual rowing and think active uh, technology into the mix. So that was uh, very pop that was popular over the winter. Go ahead in the next slide. Um, I want to give you a quick update on programming. Um, a big strategic initiative for us is to grow our youth under 15 programs, which is middle school, and that is a, uh, something that is really starting to ramp up in the sport of rowing. We want to take a lead in this, and we did this in conjunction with our relationship with Arshay Cooper. He, he they provided a grant for us, and so we're in 
we have several schools. The high idea this is that a program is about inclusion, so it's not one school or it's it's multiple schools coming together and training training as one. So kids from from southeast to FD Moon to to the northwest side to Mustang. So it's been you can see the every single machine is taken up when they come out. We've had over 70 kids involved. We're kind of at our capacity at the moment, but um, it's a real good signal about where we're going with that program. Go ahead, next slide. And then our broader range of youth programs, um, despite the fact there was no great, uh, I mean, it, we, we made it work, but, but the, the athletes didn't get a lot of time on the water before their first race, and um, they did very well in Austin, and we have several kids getting full ride college scholarships. Um, for next year because of this program. And um, I know you see that pink boat there, that's Mercy, we have a fleet of new boats. I, I think I reported last time that Mercy is a big part of that. Those are going around the, the country when we go to these events, and so we share that with them. And then uh, there's a graphic of the OKC Youth Invitational. This is an event we've postponed a little bit. To, thankfully, we got some rain, so we got water back in the river quicker. We were worried about that. Um, Normally that's over spring break, it's now in April. That event has grown into a sizable rowing event in addition to all of what else we do, so that'll happen here in a couple of weeks. Go ahead in the next slide. And then we also had indoor rowing championships. Uh, lots of activity for that. Um, again, this is something that so many different groups, whether it be youth, corporate, uh, veterans, all different groups came down and, and participated in that. And, we're looking to continue to expand this indoor rowing league, even throughout the state eventually. Go ahead, next slide. Then fundraisers, we had a very successful fundraiser that you see on the left, which is a chili cook-off. It replaced our annual per perfect finish. as a great change and uh, greatly exceeded the fundraising goal. Um, I encourage you, you know, next year, we'll make sure that's on your calendar. It was very well, uh, well received. Coming up is Champagne and Oysters with very much a Paris flair to it, given the Olympics. Champagne and Oysters supports our Olympic hopefuls and high performance, and it'll be kicking off the Olympic trials, so the athletes will receive their official Olympic trials bibs at this event, and it's going to be a very inspiring event. It's, again, always a lot of fun. We will certainly get invitations to you, and this is, uh, uh, we're going to actually have the the president of the International Federation here for this event, International Canoe Federation. So it'll be really an opportunity for us to continue to deepen that relationship. Go ahead, next slide. Uh, this is, Dennis already reported on this, but I just, you know, some images of the river uh, draining process and the work that was done um, and the dam when it did uh, start to open up. Um, we're kind of in that uh, cleanup period. There's a lot of work to be done just to restore the area around the Chesapeake Boathouse. Uh, but they're working at it, and so that's kind of what our, our focus is now. So it's a great, great improvement. Go ahead. Next slide. Uh, the bike park prog prog progress. I mean, we're, we're really uh, pleased about uh, this development. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the community. We have uh, community user groups that meet regularly on this. Uh, we call it the trailhead because it literally links to the Eastern Greenway Trail. You can go east or west and eventually around the whole city from this location, um, designed by Wade Scaramucci and his team. And then we received uh, recreational trails grant funding and T-set funding, as well as a lot of private support and um, some other contributions as well. In fact, um, Hydroflask Flask nationally is donated to this project because they see this as a big part of how we're engaging the community in the outdoors. If you recall, we received an outdoor foundation grant a few years ago, one of the first four cities to ever receive that, and it's gone so well, we're getting continued investment from the outdoor industry into what we do in Oklahoma City. So that project is scheduled to be done uh, by this summer, so that's it's well underway. Go ahead, next. And then this is a new project. Um, just to kind of underscore the engagement in, of the users of the venue, um, one of the young men who's in the youth the river sport program is trying to get his Eagle Scout, or he's getting his Eagle Scout, and he made his project putting artificial turf in the entire finish line tower seating area. 
Now, honestly, I think it was a little bigger project than he thought it was going to be when he set out, but it became this massive project that every, all the youth programs rolled out to help him accomplish, and all the materials were donated, all the work was donated, um, and it's a massive improvement. It makes that area much nicer, just in time for, again, Row Fest this year, which is going to be huge. Okay, go ahead, next. And then I want to talk about Olympic trials. This is like a, a, obviously a monumental event for us. Um, it will be, we are working with um, NBC. It is going to have full coverage uh, throughout on the Peacock network and also throughout all their streaming platforms. So we're doing a, a big production with this because there's a lot of interest because it is historic. It'll be the first ever Kayak Cross Olympic trials, which will make its debut in Paris. And they expect that to be highly, very popular because it's fast paced and exciting, but you can see the schedule there. It'll be April 26th and 27th, culminating on the 27th with Kayak Cross. And then Team USA will be announced at the end of that event on the 27th with some fireworks and a lot of fanfare. Um, so again, we're, it's, it's gonna be very important that we pack the house. So we, we really wanna spread the word. We're working on bringing schools down on the 26th to be there. We have about 500 kids so far scheduled. We're going to have an event called the Olympic Experience that will go along with it so um, the public can participate and try different Olympic sports. I mean, obviously ours from rowing and canoe kayak to gymnastics with Bart Connor to uh, rock climbing and, and, and surfing. So all of that will be happening in conjunction with the trials and it's also opening weekend for river sport. And so people will be able to go rafting that same weekend on the uh, Outer Channel as well. So very busy, very busy weekend in Oklahoma City with the marathon and arts festival. And um, so we're, make, we're, we're coordinating, but it's gonna be quite a big deal. The, the public can come in to watch from the, the hillside area, that's free. We wanted to make sure it was accessible to all. And then we will have premium seating on the south side of the channel with seats and shade and and VIP uh, benefits, but we want to remove all barriers of entry to just make people feel a part of this. As you all know, this sport is a big part of our future, and we have a world championship in just a couple of years. So we're getting volunteers, training volunteers, gate judges, timers, all of those things are going to be really important. So we're using this as a, a kind of a real kickstart to that effort. So, and that's all I have. Is there any questions? Any questions for Mike? Busy time coming up. It is busy time. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Need a motion to accept that? Cast your vote. And that passes. Item E is a management and use agreement with Epic Paintball Park LLC to continue preliminary activities related to the proposed construction and operation of a recreational paintball facility on our property around 10th and county line. Uh, we've been dealing with this for a few years and he keeps getting extensions uh, because of his trying to get the uh, program put together. So and Kathy's uh, use committee has looked at this and you're okay with this, Kathy? Yes, we are. There were circumstances that he was not able to produce and so we're giving him this extension to be able to, to do the things that he would like to do and that we definitely want him to do. Yeah. So this is one year extension till March 25. Mm -hmm. Any questions? A motion. How many years has it been so far? I take a ballpark because it's not a good sign when you have to think real hard about it. Jeez. I think at least four years. Right. Outside of I-40, uh, since the early 2000 teens. Oh, okay. And he's been in this location since 2021. Yeah. Okay. To this location. All right. Thank you. Okay. Catch you both.
in that passes. Item F is a revocable permit with the National MS Society for the Walk MS Oklahoma City on May 18th using the South River Trail. Need a motion? Cast your vote. That passes. Item G is an ordinance amendment to Chapter 60 of the Oklahoma City Municipal Code 2020 related to certain permit fees applicable to the North Canadian River Corridor Recreation Area. We have uh, Scott Fairman here to answer any questions you might have. Scott, you want to give us a Cliff Notes version of what's going on here? I'll do my best. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and Trustees. I'm Scott Fairman, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. So essentially, this is part of a bigger effort um, to review our fees and assess our current fees in parks. Um, and so obviously there's a few fees that are part of the, the OCR system. Um, this, this particular one is pretty minor. It just gives us the ability to rent the restroom in a special event uh, permit as opposed to only an irrevocable permit, how it's currently written. So it just gives us a little more flexibility in, a, in another product for our, our uh, citizens to, to have. And then it also allows a fee for staff uh, assistance when we when we deem that staff is necessary to to be in an event. Any other questions? I'll be happy to, to answer those. Any questions for Scott? Okay, thanks, Scott. Need a motion? Cast your vote. That passes. Item six is the claims docket. Any questions on the claims docket? Motion. Cast your vote. That passes. Item seven is comments by staff. You have the written report from Melissa in your packet. Any questions? Okay, motion to accept that. Cast your vote. And that passes. Any comments from trustees? Any citizens to be heard? We are adjourned.